please welcome Christopher Rumpf. All right. GitHub. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Thanks for taking some time, both online and here, to uh, listen to this talk today. Um, let's give it up for the uh, GitHub Universe event team real quick. This event's been a lot of fun. I've, uh, I've had a blast. I hope everybody's learning some, good, some cool new stuff. Um, these events are not easy to do, right? So kudos to the team so far for everything they've done. Um, before I get into my talk today, uh, I wanted to uh, take a minute to introduce myself, some of my experiences, some of my history here, so you kind of get a feel for uh, why I have such a passion to be partnering here and why I'm so humbled to be partnering with GitHub uh, on, this, uh, on these, these announcements of um, ARM and other compute technologies becoming available inside of the GitHub uh, ecosystem and platform. So um, this, this is a funny story. I think you'll, you'll get a kick out of it. So um, my first job out of university was uh, I was hired by a prominent semiconductor company. And I was given one job. Okay, And that job was to uh, fix a problem that they had. And the problem was uh, every morning when the people came to the office, uh, their firmware, their software build was broken. Okay, they work all day to fix the thing, to debug it, fix it. And then they you know, claim success, open the, open the gates, right? Everybody pushes their code back in. It breaks again. Next morning we come in, got to redo all that over again. That was the problem. That was my first job out of university, to fix that problem, right? So we sat down and we looked at the problem space, we looked at everything, and uh, what we decided to do, uh, this is kind of funny, right? We created a concept called a build request, OK? The build request was a web form. It had a, this is back in the day before there was uh, Git. Git hadn't even been around yet. There was no cloud. There was, we were using CVS and Subversion back in the day, OK? And so what we did was we built the concept of a build request. It had a relational SQL database on the back end, all the parameters for the build, everything goes in there. And uh, then we had like a private cloud environment with the captive lab hardware set up, and we would go off, the agents would run, pull the database, pull the build request down, go configure the build machine, do the build, deploy it across a lab environment uh, where we could test and validate. And this is a pre-commit uh, pre trigger that we, that we implemented, right? And this became the, the lifeblood of the organization over time. And it really created a passion in me for uh, this methodology and for bringing this uh, kind of capability uh, to all of my customers and all of my projects uh, uh, in the world. Um, uh, I also kind of, you know, the funny part about that story is I think I kind of missed a huge business opportunity, right? I mean, we could have been here talking about uh, Rumpyverse or something like this, right? But here we are, it's, it's GitHub now, right? So uh, I guess I was interested in different things back then. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the announcement that you heard today, GitHub Runners on ARM, uh, I believe that whether you're working on embedded projects like I just described with a, with a, you know, a, a special platform, or whether you're just doing financial or any, kind, any other kind of software development, I believe uh, these concepts and the benefits of the ARM Compute platform will benefit everybody in this room. And I believe that so much. I think everybody that's sitting here right now should just take out your phone and go sign up for the private preview that was just announced a couple hours ago. Just do that now. Just Google for um, uh, GitHub Runners, GitHub uh, ARM-based runners. Sign up for the preview. Get your spot in that seat because you're going to you're going to see the potential of what we're doing in this, in this talk today. We've got some, some demos, some videos to show you. And um, again, regardless of your environment or your software project, uh, I believe you're going to see some value here. So the way I structured this talk today was uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of the disruption that's going on in the automotive industry. I'm using automotive as the frame for, because I believe that this is one of the most complex and most difficult disruptive forces that's happening in the, that we've seen in markets in general for a long time. And I believe uh, the, the constraints that we'll talk about and the complexity increases that are happening here um, require some new thinking and some new methodologies that I believe are only available on the ARM, uh, within the ARM compute ecosystem. We'll get into a demo. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about SOFI, which is our scalable open architecture for the embedded edge, why that's so important to the automotive industry. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end about sustainability and uh, why ARM Compute is just uh, uh, going to help us all uh, with our sustainability goals uh, that we all have. 
Before I jump in, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people here have actually have experience with embedded, embedded software? Uh, it could be MicroPython or whatever. OK, that's good. We, we had about half the audience uh, uh, raise their hand, which is good. How, and here's a good one. How, how many people know what the, what the, what the acronym ARM, A-R-M, actually stands for? OK, like nobody, right? So, so come to the booth, uh, and I want to know if my team can't answer that question. All right, so come get me in. If my team can't answer the question in the booth, we need to, yeah, I need to know that so I can harass them uh, a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about the disruption that's happening uh, in, the automotive, in the automotive market. So essentially what's happening is the complexity of the computing system and the software that's going into these cars uh, in order to reach these autonomous drive and these other uh, goals is just uh, exploding. Okay, And even the tech leaders who um, were first to market with some of these uh, autonomous or these um, ADAS Plus, Level 3, even some of these systems, even their productivity, you've heard a lot about productivity and how important productivity is to development and developers. Uh, even the market leaders are still nowhere near closing the gap between the complexity of these systems and, the, uh, and their current output. And, and so we have to think differently about how are we going to enable this, uh, this complexity curve? How can we think differently? How can we work differently, work smarter to enable and tackle this, uh, this complex problem? The, the other way that I think about this, right, whenever I think about test, I always joke with my team, like anybody can develop anything, right? The testing is the hard part of developing. Um, I was just a funny San Francisco story. I was just uh, walking to dinner the other night and uh, in the middle of an intersection, there was a person dancing uh, with some music, and they were filming or something. I don't really know what was going on. It was kind of a crazy scene. Lots of cars were beeping and things. And then an autonomous vehicle comes driving down the street, and it gets right beside the person in the intersection, and the, it, the car just stops. Right? It, just, it just stops, because that's what happens when, they're, when they don't know what to do and they can't make a decision. It just stops. And so I was just thinking to myself, that, that's a perfect example of the test problem that exists in the automotive market. That car stopped in the middle of the intersection. That's dangerous. That is in, 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 but what they're doing is that data set of that person dancing in the middle of the street, I mean, that's hard to replicate in a lab. That's hard to, so, so that's why we're all out driving these cars. We're getting the data. We're testing it. But that is not, uh, we have to think differently about how we approach these problems. And if you're not careful, the, the cost of your t validation is going to make the project, frankly, unobtainable. So again, we have to think differently about how we approach these kinds of problems. So if we think about this, like why, like, okay, I talked about complexity in vague terms, right? Like what specifically is driving that complexity? Well, the, for the past 100 years, right, the automotive industry is primarily a manufacturing industry. It's not a high-tech uh, industry, right? In the old days, uh, where we're coming from, the vehicles had a lot of discrete systems in the vehicle. So the supply chain was very tightly controlled, and these discrete components were uh, manufactured, put on the shelf, uh, and available for 10 years, right? And uh, the manufacturers would bolt the, the cars together, assemble it on the assembly line, and off they go. You have some very lightweight communication happening on uh, the comms buses. Uh, maybe there's emission control, there's ignition control. Again, discrete elements, right? And what was the brain that was driving the car? It was your brain. Okay, it's your brain that's driving the car. So you're using all of your sensors, all of your uh, capabilities to drive the car. In the next generation, what we're working with our partners on is how can we you know, enable the car to be the brain? So to do that, we have to consolidate all of the workloads together in a larger uh, heterogeneous compute environment that has multiple different computing elements inside of that computer. And the workloads in the supply chain can no longer just act autonomously, right? They, they can't act by themselves. They can't produce a discrete box that you just plug into the car anymore. They have to change the, the whole, this disrupts the whole supply chain. So everybody now needs to figure out what is the platform, how does my workload integrate into that platform, and how do we collaborate? You've heard a lot about collaboration this week, right? How do we collaborate in an environment where we can get real-time or close to real-time feedback on the changes that are happening in the software stack for this super complicated 
uh, supercomputer that's getting put in the car and needs to control all of those discrete systems and more actuation of the, of the vehicle and all this stuff. This is a hard problem. And um, it's harder because of the um, productivity curve that we looked at earlier, okay, and the test curve. So I'm going to jump into some concepts next about um, how ARM architects the CPUs um, before I get into the demo, um, because this is kind of foundational, foundational knowledge that I want everybody to kind of understand. So when ARM builds a CPU, what we do is we, we service four main businesses today. We service uh, the mobile, uh, data center, um, IoT, and of course automotive. And uh, when we go and build a CPU, what we do is we look across all those segments, li like any organization would, and we maximize our reuse of that CPU architecture across these segments, right? So what's happening today, what's new today, we've been doing that for many years, right? But what's new today is that with the adoption of our uh, compute technology in the data center, which is starting to become more prevalent, as you heard from the announcement this morning with GitHub deciding to invest in the ARM compute node natively into the GitHub uh, uh, Actions product, um, we're starting to see uh, this compute technology, frankly, become ubiquitously available now, right? It's, it's in the cloud, it's at the edge, and that opens up some really interesting innovations that not only just ARM's investing in, but the ARM ecosystem is investing in how we can kind of capture or think differently, again, about the test problem or about the development problem, um, and how can we leverage the fact that the same CPU architecture is now ubiquitously available, or if it's not the same architecture, components of the same architecture are ubiquitously available. Um, not all other compute architectures are version controlled the way that we do it and released in the way that we do this. So your mileage varies with other compute architectures on the capability to kind of um, take advantage of these, these capabilities. Um, so that all sounds great in theory, fine. Now you have a little understanding about like how ARM does our stuff, but like, what, like who cares? Like what's the point, right? Like the point is is that if you look at how these embedded systems are generally uh, developed over time, what you see here on the left is uh, a very long hardware design phase, usually spanning multiple years, where there's no platform available to run the software. Right? So what it means is that software development has to wait until an actual platform is available. That could be an FPGA, could be a test chip. A lot of test chips cost millions of dollars to go tape out. Um, you know, and then there's, of course, production vehicles and all that stuff, too. Now, what the industry has been doing for the past many dec several decades has been investing in modeling technologies, virtual prototype technologies, um, these kinds of things that, uh, frankly, in, the, in, the, in where we're coming from, these technologies were always kind of wounded in some way. What I mean by that is um, you could use them, you could deploy them, but a lot of times they weren't binary or register compliant to the end, to the end device. So what that means is your code execution, if you're using these models, a lot of times you might have pound of fines, you might have different board support package, you might have different drivers, you might have different, it, it's like a different stack. Right? It's like it could be a completely different stack running over here. And so what you're doing is, yeah, you might be able to do some algorithm development. You might be able to do a piece of your stack. But frankly, you can't trust, uh, the, you, the, especially when it comes to safety applications, you need more, um, uh, you need to get closer to the target. Right? So what would happen is, in the old days, on the left, you'd be doing all this development work. You'd be doing all this testing work. And then when the hardware came, you had to redo all that testing work. Right? You have to redo all that work. And it, you, so you're kind of not, you know, okay, you might get an algorithm done, but your whole system still needs to get completely revalidated and re-regression re tested. So you're kind of no, not off any better. So what we're, what we're trying to think differently about is how can we, thanks to this compute architecture being more ubiquitously available, how can we shift left the software development, DevX on ARM in GitHub, and show that we can um, take advantage of this capability in a way that's more um, appropriate for the target end system, right? Um, so what I'll walk you through today is a demo using the ARM 
uh, Sophie software stack. Uh, this is a cloud native uh, software stack uh, where I'll get into kind of how and why the uh, containers that we're deploying in this demo are relevant and how it will help move the industry forward. Um, we'll talk a little bit about virtual prototypes and some of the innovations that we're seeing in our ecosystem that are taking advantage of this instruction set or CPU architecture uh, parity or ubiquitousness that exists. Um, and wh what I'm not going to talk about is the first bullet up here, which is the, the library or the binary development uh, 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 aspect. I just want to kind of review this with you here. We were talking a lot about AI this week, right? And um, ARM, as you know, AI workloads, right, run on CPUs. They run, they run on many different types of computing elements, uh, predominantly today uh, on CPUs. And what um, ARM has, okay, is li like many other CPU architectures have, is we have a um, scalable vector extension inside of our CPU that uh, is perfect for matrix math or AI workloads, right? And so what you can imagine doing is, is because this compute architecture is now available everywhere, right, what you could imagine doing is you could imagine architecting your software in such a way that you have a library of, for SVE that exploits the capability and the value of SVE. You could compile that binary in your GitHub Actions workflow on a native GitHub runner. You could create this library of AI capabilities, this matrix math library. And uh, you can then promote that artifact. You could fully validate that artifact and promote that artifact inside of your CI CD environment in, in GitHub. Then a downstream job later can come back, pick up that artifact, that fully regression tested artifact, and deploy it into their, uh, the next system integration or the next job in that workflow. Uh, that capability of uh, developing, that's just one example, right, of developing that library of capability, fully regression testing it, and then when it gets deployed or slurped into your downstream job, all you have to do there is validate that the interfaces and the integration of that binary is valid. You no longer have to retest that integration, even if you're deploying it on a target. And the reason why is because of the version instruction set of that CPU architecture. Okay? So, you know, thinking differently about how we architect our software, how we uh, test and validate our software, and how we can exploit these capabilities in these native environments is uh, what this talk today is all about. So hopefully, when we're done, hopefully you, you'll, the creative juices will be flowing, and uh, you'll all see, uh, see what's possible here. So here's the, the video demo. I've got three slides with some movies here. And what we um, are showing here is essentially a, this is our, our Sophie project, which is a cloud native project uh, that abstracts away the, what, what, what I call a non-differentiated computing layer for automotive. So we believe that the industry, um, in order to uh, succeed at this autonomous and, and, and beyond vision that the automotive industry has, we believe that we need to provide a um, stable and versioned uh, compute platform that is, frankly, from an OEM or from an auto manufacturer perspective, not uh, that differentiated from a computing element point of view. Everybody's going to need this computer. Everybody's going to need this capability. So how can we just define a hardware layer that provides that? And then that hardware layer has firmware in it that has to be abstracted away so that the, um, so that the ecosystem and the supply chain can then develop their applications in a frictionless way and get reuse out of that, right? Because what's going to happen is you're going to have multiple suppliers all trying to um, deliver workloads into this computing system. And so how can you do that? And so we propose one way to do that is with a container-based architecture. Now, of course, with any virtualization layer or container-based architecture, we need to um, think about expanding those requirements to cover real-time, mixed critical, and other kind of heterogeneous computing element requirements. And the, this talk, this, this project rather, is very focused on working with the community to implement those kinds of uh, features and capabilities uh, over the next couple of years. Um, but today, this demo, this does not have mixed critical uh, orchestration in it yet, but it shows, at least in theory, on a base uh, platform with our, with our, that, that can leverage the Sophie stack, it has a vision demo. And so what you see here 
is the first step in the CI/CD job that's running here is uh, building this container in this application. Uh, there's actually three containers. There's the video input container, there's the uh, inference container, and the application container that ties everything together. So all three of these artifacts are compiled, built, they run unit tests on them, and at the end of this step, uh, we have a functionally, essentially, we have a functionally validated binary, right, that we can, that we can move on to the next stage and promote up in our, in our uh, workflow. The next step, what we do here is, remember how I mentioned the virtual prototypes? So we um, have in our ecosystem several partners that implement virtual prototypes. One of them uh, is here in, in with us today. It's from a company called Corellium, and I've chosen to use their technology in this demo because what they've done is they've uh, really leaned into this capability of that uh, computer architecture uh, uh, ubiquity, okay? What they've done is they've implemented a, instead of in the old days, remember how I mentioned the virtual prototyping, would be done kind of in user space as a C program. Uh, what Corellium technology does is it literally maps the instructions from your binary. It maps the instructions down as pass through to the underlying compute layer that's running on a Graviton or on a uh, Azure, on a, uh, uh, an ARM node in the GitHub runner uh, environment. So why is that so important and meaningful? It's because what it's doing is it's giving you the instruction, the computer level parity between whatever's happening up in the cloud to whatever your end target is on, on the edge. This is, never, this is new. This has never been done before. And what the other key aspect of this is the way that this partner has chosen to implement this technology is that it is binary and register level compatible. So now all of a sudden what you can do is you don't have to recompile, you don't need to cross compile, you don't need to deal with different C flags, different pound defines, different board support packages, different drivers, all that stuff goes away. You compile once, you, um, you then promote that artifact, that binary, and you can deploy that binary not only to this implementation of a virtual prototype, but also to the physical platform and the physical board. This is like groundbreaking stuff. This has never been possible before. Um, and uh, we're seeing many other creative implementations of this kind of instruction mapping uh, or, or, let's say, leveraging the compute ubiquity. Um, and I think you all, I challenge you all to think about this and come by our booth and talk, talk to us about this because I think we're just, this is like the tip of the iceberg. I think it was uh, Thomas was saying yesterday in the keynote yesterday how uh, he's excited to see how everybody just like takes Copilot and like creates new creative things that they never thought of before. I kind of agree with him and I think that this is the type of technology or capability that is uh, similar in that kind of spirit where I think once you all get your creative mind set on this, I think uh, we're going to start to see all sorts of really clever and creative uh, implementations here. So what we've just shown is now we can deploy this to a, uh, a virtual prototype. Again, so, so think about this too. Remember the testing, the testing issue with the physical hardware and the car that stopped in the middle of the, in the, middle of the intersection. Well, couldn't we, couldn't we do some testing here if we had a virtual prototype of the compute system? Like why do we need to drive the cars around? You know, couldn't we, do, couldn't we get more done up in here, right? So, so these are the kinds of innovations, these are the kinds of thinking that we're, that we're, that we're working through. Um, and then the, the, the next piece of the demo, right, is of course, you know, what you see here is a picture of the actual physical computer. This is, this is the computer, the, the board, that, uh, that job, that, that, that we just, that binary that we just compiled and then we deployed it to the virtual prototype. We literally took the same binary, did not recompile it, did not do anything to it and deployed it to this board and it runs. And now what you see, what you'll see in the demo in a minute, if you haven't already seen, is the, the demo will display, I think it's this one, it's doing some testing here, and then it will come up and it will start drawing bounding boxes around the car. This is a vision, a vision demo. So you start to see some bounding boxes, and this is the AI, and this is actually using that uh, compute element that I mentioned earlier called SVE. So this is, this is actually leveraging all that. So um, there you go, there's the bounding box there. So, um, again, you know, you can start to see, hopefully you can start to see this, uh, this capability uh, and, and the, 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 um, the, uh, the power that this brings to this area. So, 
you know, what we're, what we're trying to see is you're never going to get away from physical hardware. Physical hardware is always going to be in the loop. You will always need to have some physical testing. I mean, you can't do, like, temperature testing or any kind of environmental testing or all these things that the automobile industry needs. You're always going to have physical testing in the loop. But how much of that can we reduce? How much can we, how much can we make it to the point where maybe can, can we get... 60% of the testing done in the cloud? Can we get 40% of the testing? Anything's better than 100% of it having to be on the edge, out there, in the streets, interrupting our lives and doing these things, right? So how can we, how can we figure out what that balance is? What are those use cases? And how can, we, um, how can we, we help move this industry forward in a collaborative and safe and safe way? Uh, and again, I think, you know, this is, this is just, uh, this, this capability is, as far as I'm concerned, it's only available on ARM. And I think within the GitHub runners environment, uh, we now, now that this private beta is available, we are going to have the opportunity to work together to uh, exploit these, these kinds of capabilities. So with that, um, let's talk for a minute about sustainability. Um, you know, I talked a lot so far just about uh, embedded software development um, and these, these, these capabilities that allow you to, um, to really accelerate and advance your, your, your embedded projects. But um, aside from the uh, embedded benefits, uh, even if you're in finance or if you're in uh, just any kind of SaaS project uh, that has no concept of an embedded edge, I mean, the ARM compute system is lower power, higher performance, uh, and lower cost, okay? So on average, what we're seeing, if you look at all the workloads that run on these things, so these numbers are going to be workload specific, okay? But from all of the workloads that we see running on the ARM nodes in the data center, on average, we're seeing somewhere around a 35% performance to price increase or benefit. So that's pretty amazing, right? Is you, all you do is you swap out your compute node with an ARM compute node, and you now have potentially 35% savings or um, you know, your job completes 35% faster. I mean, I, I was thinking back to my very first job there where um, you know, we set up an SLO or an SLA around our CI CD. We wanted it to run in, in one hour. The whole test ran in one hour. If I could shave you know, 30% of time off of that, that's amazing. Right? What would I do with that time? I would personally add more tests in so that I could get more data and more, more confidence about the maturity of my software for my software teams uh, at the same price point, at the same performance level, at the same SLO. Um, maybe that's not uh, what you want to do. Maybe what you want to do is maybe you want to give back a little bit to the environment. Maybe you just, you know, you, you can reduce your carbon footprint here. You can um, uh, just pocket that savings right, and uh, uh, get your work done faster. Um, but I always joke, um, software people are greedy. We always want more, 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 and uh, let's, just, let's just get more, get more going. So uh, just as a proof point here, the um, customer, like this particular customer, Nitin, I mean, th again, this is why it's so workload dependent, but this person's workload, I mean, look at that number. By switching to the ARM data center node, this workload saw almost a 60% increase. I mean, that's bananas. That's bonkers. So um, I, that's why I said at the very beginning, take out your phone and sign up for this thing right now. Because I, you know, you're going to get in there even 10 15%. If that's your benefit, it's still huge. It's still huge to me. Um, so I, again, I just, I just, this is just amazing, amazing stuff. So that's basically the whole talk. Um, it looks like I'm up on time. Uh, so hopefully that was insightful. Stop by our booth. Um, happy, to, happy to carry this conversation on uh, as, as the GitHub Universe uh, event continues, OK? Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.